Thank you all for joining. My name is Brian McPherson. Uh, I'm the Director of Strategy here at Hydrian. Um, also on the phone with me, we have our CEO and co-founder, Josh Bartell. Um, today we're talking about quantifying the stock, uh, cost of stock out. And uh, the group we kept, you know, it's been shared to a pretty small group of people. So we hope for this to be an interactive session. However, uh, rather than unmuting your mic, um, as we kind of go along through the presentation, we would appreciate if you would just in the chat, ping us um, and we will stop to answer your questions as we go along. Um, in terms of Hydrian, we are an inventory optimization company. So this is an issue we talk about with our clients pretty often. Um, what we do specifically is we work with our clients and create strategies and then work with them on a daily basis to execute those strategies. So that involves lowering inventory investment and or increasing service level. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our CEO, Josh Bartel, who's gonna walk us through this deck. Awesome, thanks, Brian. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for joining everyone. Like Brian said, uh, we were hoping to kind of keep this to like five or 10 people. So I think we have a pretty good group today. Um, and I hope that I get a chance to talk with each of you um, and address questions that come up. So, you know, at, at a very high level, we know that when we are out of stock on an item in inventory, we're gonna lose sales. That's the whole reason why we hold inventory. Um, but often I think it's it's uh, taking the next step and figuring out what's the actual financial impact of being out of stock um, is a step that companies often don't take. And part of it's because it's not an intuitive thing to calculate. Um, and our systems, usually like our ERP or accounting systems, often are not super helpful in doing that because of the way that they track or don't track information about your inventory levels over time. So um, there are workarounds for that. And in this talk, I'm gonna get pretty specific. Um, you know, we'll start general about why this is important and kind of at a high level how it works. Uh, and then I'll get pretty specific about how you can kind of set up a data workflow to, to start tracking this metric at your warehouse. Um, I think the most important reason why a company should have a very good understanding of its stockout cost is because any talk that we have about changing our inventory investment is usually in an effort to, if we're increasing the inventory investment, reduce stockouts, or if we're lowering our inventory investment, we are trying to free capital, but we know there's going to be some kind of a customer service impact. We're going to be out of stock more often. And if you don't know what you're getting for the additional investment, if it's increasing, or what you're losing if you're decreasing your inventory investment, um, you only have one side of the picture. All you know is dollars you know, changed in inventory. And that really is just one side of it. So um, in this talk, we'll talk about you know, how to get very precise about these things. And what we hope is that at your business, that can lead to a conversation that's um, based on data and based on a return on investment. So when you say, look, I am looking to increase our inventory investment by a million dollars, and your CFO or CEO says, well, what are we gonna get for that? You can say, well, it should provide a return of you know, 2X over the next year, and we hope to get $2 million of additional gross profit from higher sales due to being in stock more often. I think that's a much better conversation than you trying to say, well, uh, our fill rate's 92% and our competitors at 94%. So what, maybe you have the right fill rate and they don't. So I think that um, this can really enable some powerful conversations. I hope it does at your business. Before we get into the meat of things, I wanna go over some key terminology. So uh, we find when we start working with a client, one of the first things we have to do is figure out what language are we gonna use here to talk about inventory performance. Uh, in stock or stock availability rate is a very common one. Um, what, the way that we usually define that and our clients define it is the percent of expected demand that you're in stock for. So um, for example, if you um, have a forecast on an item uh, of 10 units per day of demand um, and you are um, you know, in a good inventory position, you have hundreds of units in stock, um, then you know, you'll have 100% fill rate on that particular item. Um, if you have another item that also sells 10 units a day and you're out of stock on it, you're out of stock on that item. So I would say you have a 50% in stock rate on those items because out of your expected demand of 20 units across both items, you're only in stock for half of it. Now, customers might place an order for both of those items. They might place an order um, for only one or none of those items. So this is the important distinction for in-stock rate is that it's based on what you predict will happen, not on what actually happens on the day of um, when demand actually hits your facility. Fill rate is, is take, takes care of that end of the metric. So fill rate is the percent of actual customer sales orders that you're in stock for. 
So assuming that you back order for your customers, and we'll talk about the different policies that, that companies have when it comes to what they do when they're out of stock on something a customer wants to order. Um, assuming that you back order a customer, let's say you, uh, same example, we're in stock on one item and out of stock on the other. Um, if a customer orders one of the uh, item that you're in stock on and one that you're out of stock on, you would have a back order rate of 50%. Um, they still bought it. Hopefully they're willing to wait for the item to be back in stock and ship to them. Um, but we know that's not an ideal situation. No one likes waiting. And we know that when we back order um, items, there's an extremely much, much higher order cancellation rate. Almost all order cancellations happen during lead time while a customer is waiting for an item to ship. Um, we know that return rates are a lot higher because often a customer will go and buy it from someone else and not remember to close out the open back order they have with you. When they get it, they don't need it. Um, or maybe just too much time has passed, the project's over. So um, we know back orders are bad, but fill rate, generally we're talking about of the actual demand you get, what could you fill? Some companies do not allow back orders. So um, a customer might place an order for something. And if you don't have it, you simply cancel the, that line off of their order or reduce the quantity to reflect what you can fill. Then you get back to the customer and let them know um, what you've done. Either way, um, fill rate is about what customers are actually ordering versus what you can fulfill from stock that day. Service level, I think, is kind of a fluid term. We hear different companies uh, using it to mean different things all the time. So um, service level, I think, really just is about how's the inventory performing. It can mean in-stock rate. It can mean fill rate. But generally, it's you know how, much, how, how well is my inventory serving my customers? And then the back order and order cancellation rate, either one, depending again on if you back order or not, it's just the inverse of your fill rate. Um, as we go through this presentation, I'm gonna try and stick with fill rate when I talk about how often we're in stock for customers, um, but forgive me if I swap things around. But generally, if I'm using in stock rate, fill rate, service level, I'm talking about the same thing. So uh, really high level, um, why do we hold inventory? So inventory is a buffer against uncertainty, and there are two primary sources of uncertainty for most uh, environments that we work with. There's the demand uncertainty. Is a customer going to buy something today? How much are they going to buy? Um, and there's supply uncertainty. So if I am selling something down and I see that I need to reorder it, my vendor hopefully will ship it to me, um, you know, in the time that I expect them to. But sometimes orders arrive early. Sometimes they arrive late. Sometimes they arrive really late if your supplier is out of stock on an item or can't manufacture it for some reason. I think we definitely have seen a lot of variability and uncertainty in both of these areas during the you know, COVID pandemic this year. Um, initially, I think supply chain issues were a bigger deal for most of our clients, particularly if they were importing items um, from overseas. In those cases, I think we you know, saw some, in some cases, someone would say, look, the, the factory in China is shut down and they're not gonna ship anything for a month. So all of their lead times are backed up, not just a month, but then you know, probably a couple of months as that factory works to get out from under the buildup the build of demand that accumulated while they were closed. And that obviously disrupts their customer service plans. Um, you know, and, and I don't think anyone could be faulted really for not holding enough inventory to get through a supplier being closed for a month. That's pretty exceptional. Um, but when it comes to the stockouts we know generally happen or just suppliers being you know, behind in their warehouse or Carriers taking an extra couple of days to deliver sometimes once the stuff is on the road to your facility. Um, I think that the uh, supply variability that you know is reasonably expectable is something you should be stocking for. Hey Josh, I wanted to stop you. We had a question come up on the previous slide, which was about which of the metrics you described are best to be tracking. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that. Um, if we're, if we're talking about in-stock rate versus fill rate, first of all, if your organization has always been measuring one and doesn't really care about the other, um, it's probably okay to stick with just one. But really, it's better to do both. Um, the thing about an in-stock rate is that it is entirely dependent on your forecast accuracy. And especially if you have a business with a long tail of low demand items with a lot of variability, you know, they sell, they might be three weeks between sales, for example, um, your in-stock rate you know, you might have a forecast of zero or a fractional quantity for something. So being out of stock on it doesn't really ding that in-stock rate very much. Um, but a customer is, is certainly going to come and buy those types of items, items from you every day. So fill rate captures that. It says, look, I'm, I'm concerned about what customers actually do. The thing that about fill rate, though, is that we're trying to measure basically how, how much demand am I getting for stuff that's out of stock. And depending on your business and how you present your stock status to customers, 
your demand might change a lot based on whether you're in stock or not. In some situations, customers literally might not be able to place an order if you're out of stock. So then when we talk about fill rate, which is really, you know, of all the demand I got, how much was I in stock for? Well, if, customer, if demand can't occur when I'm out of stock, then your fill rate becomes kind of a meaningless metric. So we recommend tracking both, um, recognizing that sometimes it's, it's difficult, especially if you're a new supply chain uh, manager, executive, trying to move the needle on getting your company to look at a new metric. That can be tough. Um, so whatever they use historically is probably fine, but if you can start sneaking in that other metric to the conversation, that's great to do. So when we talk about what we do every day, which is inventory optimization, um, we're really trying to minimize cost. And we think about three major costs when we talk about inventory. So there are ordering costs. Basically, what does it cost every time I replenish my inventory? So I got to create the purchase order, contact the vendor, get the stuff on order, receive it in the warehouse, check it in, put it away. Um, those costs are typically fairly fixed around a given order, regardless of the quantity. So yeah, it takes a little bit longer to check in, you know, 50 packs than it does to check in 25 packs of bolts, let's say. But all that other legwork that I talked about, putting something away, you know, the forklift's got to go to that location and put those 25 or 50 packs away no matter what. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't take any more time to do more. Generally, if we're talking about really big, bulky items, sure, then it changes. But these ordering costs are relatively fixed. And so that means we can change them because while we always have to buy what we sell, if we sell 1,000 units something a year, we got to buy 1,000 units from our supplier, we can change how many receipts we have. So we could buy all 1,000 on January 1st. We would never recommend doing that. Um, but some, in some cases you have to, or, or it might be economical to do so. And that's gonna have the lowest ordering cost. Um, you know, the highest ordering cost would be every time I sell one unit, buy one unit, and I'd have a thousand receipts a year and there'd be a ton of time and motion in the facility. So those ordering costs are one side, major side of things. And there's holding cost. So we know that when we have something in stock, we have um, capital and space tied up in this inventory that could be used for other purposes. And generally, um, companies have a, a way of measuring this. It's a um, cost of capital or um, their hurdle rate, whatever you want to call it. And we're trying to balance those two costs. And um, many of you, if you're in supply chain, have heard of economic order quantity. That's literally a mathematical function to determine, given some item attributes and demand attributes, what's the lowest possible total cost between ordering costs and holding. Because if I, play, if, if I did the extreme I talked about, place that order on January 1st for 1,000 units, I have to hold it all year. So while I've minimized ordering costs, my holding costs are very high. The other extreme, obviously, very low holding costs because I'm literally only holding one unit at a time, but I have very high ordering costs. So there's a way to minimize those two. But the arguably the largest cost, depending on your business, this is true for most companies, of inventory management is stock out cost. It's what you pay when you're out of stock on something. And um, that's obviously what this whole talk is about. But it's really important, I think, when people talk about, oh, we manage our inventory using EOQ. Well, that's great. EOQ for, doesn't get into it all, first of all, where should I reorder? So at what point should I reorder inventory? It's only about how much I should order at one time. And it doesn't account for stockout cost at all. So that's why it's, EOQ is part of an inventory management philosophy. It is a small part that ignores a major cost. So when we're looking at um, what drives stockout cost, um, we really need to be thinking about two questions. One is, when do I need to reorder something as my inventory level sells down? And how much should I buy at one time? So here we have kind of laid out on the screen. Um, Hydrain folks, can you see my mouse cursor on the screen? Yes. Awesome. OK, so this is just a very simple inventory model. Uh, the red line up here is our inventory on hand over time. So as demand occurs, we're selling down our inventory. And we get to this um, light blue line here which is, oh, I'm sorry, that's the average, never mind, this gray line here, which is our reorder point. And that's the point at which we order more inventory from our supplier. Of course, while we're in lead time then, waiting for inventory to arrive, inventory continues selling down. Then at the end of lead time, this receipt arrives and our inventory level pops back up because we get this replenishment and start selling down again. This bottom chart on the same time axis is looking at stock out risk. So what, are the, what is the likelihood I'm going to have a stock out on this item? Obviously, even the day after you get a replenishment from your supplier, you've just gotten new inventory, a huge customer order could come through and wipe it all out. But that's really unlikely, and that's why this, the odds of a stock out are so low. But they rise exponentially as um, our inventory level decreases. And 
during lead time, of course, is when we're most likely to have a stock out. So these kind of red zones here represent our riskiest time from an inventory perspective when we're most likely to have stock outs. If we, to use this example, um, doubled our order quantity. So we ordered twice as much at one time. You can imagine this kind of shark fin looking shape here would be twice the height. So it'd go all the way up to here and it would take twice as long to sell down. Well, that would effectively have the number of receipts per year. That's that order cost going down. And it would also have the number of instances per year that we are in this red zone high danger level with our inventory. So I hear a lot of conversations at clients about what's your safety stock strategy or how much safety stock do we need? And that is a very important question for preventing stock outs. You're effectively setting your um, reorder point when you talk about safety stock. It's definitely a huge part of service level and fill rate and all that stuff. But how much we order has a direct and measurable impact on our in stock rate. So um, safety stock is just one part of the question. Um, and we certainly don't, by the way, recommend that everyone go out and double their order quantities because like we talked about before, ordering more inventory at one time, making this shark fin higher, your average inventory level, which in this case is this uh, dotted light blue line, um, is going to increase. So we get a lot of questions um, from clients about what's the right fill rate for my business or the right in-stock rate. Um, there is certainly not a right answer for this, even within a really well-defined industry where you're looking at yourself and a very similar competitor. I would argue you should not at all target the same fill rate that they do necessarily. You might happen to have the same fill rate, but there are very good reasons why your fill rate should be different. So when we look at, for, for, and another thing I'll say is you definitely don't want to set this at the, um, you don't want to say, okay, I have a 95% fill rate goal and make that your goal for every item. Um, there are items where if they're really consistent sellers, they have a really short, consistent lead time from the supplier. I would hope it's much higher than 95%. Um, if your overall average is 95%. And there are items where, you know, they're big, expensive import items. They take forever to arrive and they sell and the demand's really chunky. Customers buy a whole bunch one day, they don't place an order for two months. Those items should have probably a significantly lower service level target than 95%. So every SKU should be different. Um, what we see most clients doing is applying kind of an ABC classification and setting fill rates around that classification. So let's say, look, my A items, my best sellers, 98% fill rate. My B items, I'll accept a 94% fill rate, and my C items, 90%. By the way, these, these numbers are obviously totally made up, and I would say that um, even within the same industry, we'll see customers where their profit-maximizing fill rate might be as low as 80%, and we'll see another client in the same industry where their profit-maximizing fill rate is over 99%. Um, that spread's really unusual. Those are the extremes, but um, when I throw out these numbers, just know there, there certainly isn't some number that's best practice. Um, some industries are probably more sensitive to it than others, but I'm going to argue again, every SKU should be looked at individually on its own merits. Some of the qualities that make me want to hold more of a SKU would be um, if it has high demand, because obviously if I'm out of stock on something that's a flagship item, that's going to have a much higher, higher cost than if I'm out of stock on something that never sells. Um, something that has... Um, long or, sh or sorry, short, consistent lead times makes me think that it's going to have a higher service level because it's just cheaper to have a higher service level. You can replenish very quickly and easily. Um, it's holding cost being higher would be a reason for an item to have a lower in stock rate. So um, the classic example is, you know, we have clients who sell bubble wrap and these are these massive, like 10 foot tall rolls that are eight feet wide and they're such a pain to move. Um, those kind of things, you know, I'll accept a lower in stock rate on those because I don't want my whole warehouse to be filled with bubble wrap and, you know, risk it. It's not going to sell as well as I think. Um, and then an item's strategic importance is also um, a factor. So if you have own brand items that are um, just a part of what you sell, you sure don't want to be out. If you're ABC company, you don't want to be out of stock on, you know, ABC brand valves if you're a valve distributor, let's say. And finally, stock out costs. What's it cost when I'm out of stock? Obviously, the higher that number is, the higher my service level should be. Um, when we when we talk about what goes into stock out cost, um, I already mentioned about returns and cancellations. There's also order management costs. So customers may call in or, or will call in more often if they're waiting on a back order to come in. Um, if you're out of stock on something and you can ship it from your vendor, if that's an option, um, the drop shipment fee you pay um, generally is going to be higher than your own internal handling and transportation costs. We know that if you're out of stock often enough, people are, you're gonna have a reputation for not being in stock often, that's diminished brand. 
Um, that certainly is a part of stockout cost. And then by far the biggest part of stockout cost is spilled demand. So customers buying something less or not buying it at all because you're out of stock. So I'm gonna kind of go through a, a breakdown of theoretical, a, a pile of demand. So you know, customers wanna buy from you, um, let's say 100 units of something, and that's the demand level you're gonna see if you have a 100% in stock rate. In other words, if you always have it on the shelf, you're gonna sell 100 units. Um, but of course you're not, you know, for many items, you're not going to have a hundred percent in stock rate. And so there are kind of two situations that happen every day. Your business is open. There are the days when you're in stock on the item and there are the days when you're out of stock on the item. And when you're in stock, um, you know, any orders that get placed are obviously going to have a hundred percent fill rate because you're filling them all from stock. When you're out of stock, there are the orders that get placed for this item. So these are back orders. Um, and then there are the orders that don't get placed. And that's really what we're trying to measure. And that's what this talk is primarily concerned with. How do I figure out the, customer, the orders my customers didn't place? Some companies try and figure this out by getting at, and that's by the way, what we call spill rate. So if we have a spill rate of 50%, that means um, I sell two units a day when I'm in stock, I sell one unit a day when I'm out of stock. So half my customers are willing to accept the back order. When people try and get at, well, how do I measure the orders I'm not getting? There's a couple of methods they use. One is, you know, if you're a fill or kill company where basically you get an order and if you can't fill it from stock, you cancel it off your customer's order. Well, you know that they tried to order it so that you count that demand. Um, and you say, that's, that's, you know, the demand I got while I was out of stock. Uh, the other way is by looking at like cart abandonment if you're an e-commerce company. Uh, so, you know, looking at how often do customers come to the website and you know, my conversion rate, uh, sorry, conversion rate would be another, another metric to look at in an e-commerce environment. My conversion rate dropped by 50% um, or my card abandonment rate went up by whatever when customers realized they weren't gonna get this stuff tomorrow because it's out of stock. Um, so uh, we have seen other companies also, like let's say they take orders by the phone, they'll have the agent mark down, oh, the customer asked for this item, but when I told them it was out of stock, they canceled their order. I'm gonna say that all of these methods um, we have found are highly inaccurate. Some of the e-commerce metrics can be good. Um, they're certainly nice to collect. All of these things are, are good to know if, if you have these data points, but there's a more um, kind of back-end way to do this that's a lot cheaper to figure out, and that's the method we're gonna describe here. So we're kind of assuming you don't have those options available to you, and even if you do, we find they're really inaccurate. So, you know, in an environment where it's like, look, customers don't have any idea if we have something in stock or not. They just fax their orders into us. We still find on days when those companies are out of stock, they get fewer orders. So somehow, whether it's because they're calling or maybe they're calling to get a quote and the agent on the phone or, or in the fax fax, stock status is being quoted. Customers are, even if you don't plan for them to, figuring out when things are in stock or out of stock and adjusting their ordering according, accordingly. Um, what, this is just kind of a quick aside your back order policies directly affect stock out costs. So I already talked about, you know, if you don't back order something, then you effectively have a hundred, if you don't allow back orders at your business, you have effectively a hundred percent spill rate because the customer literally can't place the order. Some of that demand will be deferred. You'll get that order later when you're back in stock. Sometimes a customer will order a substitute item. Um, but, but once you take into account the kind of intangible brand costs and these other costs, it's a hundred, uh, you know, a, a company that doesn't allow back orders has close to a hundred percent spill rate or um, stock out cost. Um, the other thing is, you know, if you, if you always ship orders complete, so that is, um, you allow back orders, but if a customer places a 10 line order and you're only out of stock on one line, you will hold those nine lines that you had in stock until that 10th one arrives from the supplier and ship them all out together. So when we talk about order fill rates, so how often do I fill the entire order from stock perfectly? Obviously, the number of lines has a big impact on that. This table here is some real-world data, um, obviously anonymized, where we look at um, a customer that has six warehouses. And some of those warehouses, just by the nature of their material, have a higher average number of lines per order. So warehouses B, C, and D all have very lousy order fill rates. You can see, you know, warehouse A has a 97% order fill rate, meaning 97% of orders ship complete on the day of the order. Warehouse B, C, and D have really lousy order fill rates. 
for warehouse C, the reason is because at the line level, they're just out of stock really often. They have the lowest in stock rate at the line level, order line level. Um, but for warehouses B and D, their line level fill rates are actually pretty good. It's just that they have so many darn lines per order, they're it's gonna be very rare or, or more rare for them to get it all right. Um, so just something to think about, if your company has a ship complete policy or you have customers that demand ship complete, um, if you're out of stock on any line for an order like that, it's just like being out of stock on the entire order. And um, you're just gonna naturally have a lower order fill rate as the number of lines increase per order. All right, so now into the kind of nitty gritty. Um, by the way, please don't, don't hesitate to shoot a message into the chat if you have a question or want me to pause and um, we can have a quick conversation about any, any topic that we're going through. Um, so how to run a study to determine spill rate. Um, the, the one sort of data point you have to start accumulating to run this sort of back-end study that I, I, taught, I mentioned earlier is your inventory positions on a daily basis. Generally, this is taken as an end of day or overnight or start of day snapshot saying on this date, we had five units available for sale. Um, one thing I wanna point out is that a lot of companies will consider things to be in stock if um, they're on order from the vendor or they have a shipping confirmation or an ASN number on an order. Um, the critical thing here is the item needs to be available for customers to buy to count as in stock. Then we're gonna look at, in this data set we're accumulating where we have a daily snapshot, every single day, and, and most ERPs allow this kind of reporting. They almost never have it historically built in. You can't say, well, what was my inventory position on this, you know, my, all my inventory for every item going back 120 days. But what you can do is say, today, I want you to give me a printout in Excel or whatever of every single item that I stock and the quantity available for sale. And hopefully you can set that up as an automated report that you run and you just accumulate this data over time. And once you have, say, 10, 15, 30 days of data, you probably have plenty of data to start making some me measurements on your spill rate, how much demand you're losing. So the important thing here is to isolate a population of items that in whatever sample set you have, let's say it's 30 days of inventory history, inventory snapshots, find items where for at least one day of that history, they had both a day with no inventory available for sale, and a day where they had at least one unit for sale at the start or end of the day. Um, and what we're trying to do there is it's basically trying to elim eliminate bias that might be happening at the item level. So for example, if you have an item um, that just naturally is more sensitive to being in stock or out of stock, or you have an item that just has low sales, um, if it's out of stock every single day, well, you can't really say, were the low sales because it was out of stock every single day or because this is just an item that doesn't sell very well. So that's why it's important that in your data you isolate and you say, okay, I only wanna see items where during this 30 day period, they had at least one day in stock and one day out of stock. Then we match that to our sales history over the same period of time, so that same 30 days, and we look at what were each item's average daily sales when they were in stock versus when they were out of stock. And you can obviously filter this down and, and look at a population of, you know, just by brand or just a certain subset of items. Um, we recommend kind of starting out doing it across your whole inventory just to see what your overall spill rate is. But what you're going to see is, okay, when we were in stock on this item, we started the day with inventory available. Um, we had $100 a day of sales. And when we were out of stock, we had whatever, $75 a day of sales. In that case, that'd be a 25% spill rate. So sales fall by 25% when we're out of stock compared to when we're in stock. That percentage number right there, I mean, that is really the number you're looking for. And it's going to drive kind of all the conversations you have from that point. Because when someone says, look, our, our fill rate is 90%. We want to get it to 95%. It's going to take this much money. You know, okay, well, if I'm in stock for, or if I'm filling 5% more orders from stock, I can tell you exactly how much more revenue we're gonna get from that and how much more gross profit because I know what my spill rate is. So I'm gonna go through two explicit examples looking at a 90% fill rate and a 95% fill rate. In both cases, we're assuming the, the spill rate is 50%. So demand falls by half when you're out of stock. We're gonna say that um, in both scenarios, there's 200 units of total demand in the market, meaning if you were always in stock, you'd sell 200 units. Um, 
just to make the math easy, let's assume we're talking about two, a 200 day period, if we're talking about um, when this 200 units um, of demand happens. So when you're in stock, customers will buy one unit per day. And let's say that you have um, a 90% fill rate, meaning that 90% of those of the demand you do get, you are able to fill from stock. So we're, we're working with fill rate and back order rate here, um, but it's going to be impacted obviously by how many days during this period we start the day with inventory available for sale. So um, 200 units are demanded and we're in stock for 82% of those days. So on uh, 100, so that means that 164 demand, uh, units will sell from stock. Then we're out of stock on 18% of those days. And there's, you know, 18% of 200 is 36. So there's 36 units of demand out there in the market. We know our spill rate's 50%. During this period when we're out of stock, we're only gonna sell half of what the actual demand is. So 18 sales, 50% of those 36 uh, out of stock units demanded, and then 18 sales are lost. And so what we end up with is 182 total sold units. Um, we sold 164 from stock and 18% or 18 units um, back ordered. And so if you do the math there, you come out with, it's around 91% um, of total, I'm sorry, it's around 90% of um, the total demand, or I'm sorry, it's 90% of the orders we actually received that we were able to fill from stock uh, or 91% of the 200 total units. So the math here is not totally intuitive, um, but something to keep in mind is that because we're talking about a fill rate or a back order rate, um, as that goes up, we are gonna be in stock on more days and sell more material in total. So to take the other example, when we have a 95% fill rate, so we have half as many back orders now. Now we're in stock on 91% of days um, where there's 182 units demanded. We're only out of stock on 9% of days. So that's 18 units demanded. 50% spill rate means of those 18 units demanded when we're out of stock, we only get nine sales. So we have nine out of stock sales or back orders and 102, uh, 182 in stock units, that's 95%. Um, that means we sell a whole total of 191. So if you look at 182 versus 191, it's roughly a 5% total unit sold increase. Um, so with a 50% spill rate, every unit, every percent of fill rate is also going to be basically a point of revenue or a point of gross profit, if that's what you're measuring. Um, I realize that was totally not, <laughs> not a clear explanation because it's a hard thing to follow in real time. Um, so we're going to send this deck out and you can kind of go through this on your own and reach out with questions too. Um, we did have one question come up, which oh, great. is what are the minimum number of days that this study can be performed over? And when we do do the study, are sales in terms of line, cost of goods sold, uh, just revenue? We use units sold in the presentation, but are there other ways to measure sales? Yeah, great question. Um, so the number of days to do the study over is gonna depend a lot on how many items you're selling and what your fill rate is on them. So um, if you have an extremely high fill rate and not many SKUs, you're not gonna have a lot of items where you are in stock and out of stock um, at least one day during a given period. So you're going to have to stretch that period out to, you know, maybe 30, 60, 90 days. If you're a business selling, you know, tens of thousands of SKUs um, and, you know, your in-stock rate or your fill rate is lower, a single day of data may be perfectly adequate for measuring, or I guess two days of data may be perfectly adequate for measuring this because um, you're going to have lots of items that just in two days are going to have a lot of, um, are going to be in stock on one day and out of stock on the other day. Uh, in terms of the, the unit of measure that we use, um, we like using revenue or units, you know, which you can obviously directly convert into revenue at the SKU level, because that's generally, if you're talking about, you know, uh, dollars of gross profit, that's going to be what you're measuring against in terms of the uh, inventory investment. So raw dollars you're having to put into your inventory to get there. If we talk about units or lines, um, it's an extra step to make that like a real financial impact. So I like to use gross profit um, on the item for, sp for uh, the spill rate cost. Um, we've mentioned, or I've mentioned uh, fixed and intangible stock out costs. So things like brand uh, perception, uh, 
generally the way that we account for this is we say, look, every time we have a back order let, or an order cancellation, if you don't allow back orders, let's ding ourselves with a fixed cost in addition to the gross profit that we calculate through our spill rate. Um, this is to account for things like back order cancellations and returns, customer service calls, um, you know, unsaleable stock. If you ship complete and you're holding on to nine lines of inventory so that you can ship that 10th when it arrives from the vendor, the storage of that inventory and you're, you're not being able to bill for it, you're not able to sell it to other customers, that has a cost. I, we mentioned drop shipping costs. So, you know, it might be typical and obviously it's going to depend on your business and what you're selling, but a typical number might be $10 per, per order line. So a customer tries to order an item um, and you don't have it in stock, so it's back ordered. We'd say, okay, well, whatever the spill rate is, let's uh, make an assumption about the gross profit we're going to lose, which we just talked about. And then let's also add 10 bucks on top of that, just to kind of make sure that even if it's a five cent washer, if it's holding up a $20,000 job from being completed, um, that's a real cost to the customer, and gross profit really wouldn't be an accurate reflection of it. Diminished brand, you know, lifetime customers um, can leave if you have enough stock outs um, or back orders. And we also know that a lot of industries are reliant on their advertised fill rate. So if you can say, hey, we're in stock 99% of the time, that can be a powerful sales driver. And so um, you obviously can't use that marketing strategy if you have a lousy fill rate. So we're basically, you know, if we're looking at um, on a per order line basis, so a customer order line basis, for different spill rates, um, we have different costs that apply. So let's, let's use that... Uh, Example before where we were saying it's $10 fixed cost per back ordered line. And let's assume that every order line we get is roughly $100 of gross profit. Um, so if we have a 0% spill rate, that means customers, there's literally no change when we're in stock versus out of stock in what customers buy. Um, they buy just as much when it's back ordered. So in this case, obviously the lost orders per back order. So every time you see a back order, um, there's not some other demand that didn't occur. You know, that flow chart we talked about, it was like, well, we get these back ordered sales, um, then there must be other sales we're not getting on that day. Well, if your spill rate is actually 0%, that's not the case. The case is um, you are always capturing 100% of demand. So the only thing you ding yourself for in that case is, oh, darn it, we had a back order. Let's ding ourselves $10 to say this customer's inconvenience and having to wait for material cost us something, even though they still accepted the order. Um, but as the spill rate climbs, and let's skip to the 50% that we've been talking about, a 50% spill rate means that when you're out of stock, sales fall by half. So any sales you do get only represent half of the demand that you could have captured. So you can count the back orders and sort of establish what you're missing out on because every back order, there's also an order you didn't get. So lost orders per back order is, is the, the term for it that we use. Um, with a 50% spill rate, it's 1.0. So for every back order, I have an order that I didn't receive. So in that scenario, my fixed costs, I have $10 I ding myself for the back order I got and $10 I ding myself for the customer who came, wanted to place an order, but didn't because I was out of stock. So $20 total fixed costs. And then um, the total gross profit I'm losing is the $100, um, which is my average gross profit per line in this scenario that I lost from that one order that I didn't get. So the total is 120. So at different spill rates, your cost per order line changes. Um, and so if we try and play that out for say, um, a large distributor that ships um, a million lines per year and has a hundred dollar average gross profit per line. So this is a hundred million dollar gross profit um, distributor. And we use those same metrics. Um, we can just do the math here and multiply it out and say, okay, well, at a 90% fill rate, I'm gonna have a hundred thousand backordered lines. Um, assuming that I have a 50%, this is the example we're highlighting here, spill rate, that means that my 100,000 backordered lines, I, there's another 100,000 I didn't get. So 100,000 lines times $100 is $10 million in lost gross profit. And then that extra $20 per order line um, backordered or lost in fixed costs, so that's another 2 million. So my total stock out losses in this scenario are $12 million. If I can get my fill rate up to 95%, all of those costs fall by half. And so I, I'm going to save myself $6 million. So in this example, if, if we know that we have a 90% fill rate and we believe that with an extra $3 million in inventory, we can get our fill rate up to 95%, well, we know from this study that we're going to capture another $6 million in gross profit. And 
that's a 2x ROI on the additional $3 million inventory investment. Um, so well worthwhile. Um, these are the kind of conversations that we're hoping can, can happen at companies that are considering changing their inventory investment, um, or at least opening people's eyes to the fact that, look, our inventory serves a really important purpose. And um, when, we, when, it, when there's an inventory failure and we're out of stock on something, um, here's the actual dollar impact that's affecting our top and bottom line. So that's the talk. Um, I think this is a topic, like I said, that I, I feel like a lot of companies are, because their systems are not helpful in allowing them to measure it. And in this case, you know, spill rate, really, you have to look at your inventory levels over time at a SKU level, which most systems don't do. They don't archive that information by default. That's really the key data unlock is starting to keep a inventory history, archiving it. Um, even if you zip those files and stick them somewhere and you don't run a study like this, it can be really handy to know, hey, on this day when this order came in and this customer wanted to place an order, um, you know, we had X units available for sale um, or we didn't have inventory available for sale. And maybe that's why we lost that order or maybe that's why this customer canceled this order. There's a whole lot of useful things you can do with this information. So starting to collect that snapshot of inventory positions every day is really valuable. And it can unlock both conversations around spill rate, but other stuff too. So um, that's kind of what I was gonna say, what's the homework from this talk? It's to start accumulating uh, inventory positions if you're not doing it already. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to fire them off in the chat. Um, you're also welcome to unmute and just ask your question out loud if you want. Um, as I said before, we're going to send this deck to everyone who participated. We're also going to um, post a video of the talk to YouTube so people can take a look and uh, go through it on their own time. And of course, you should feel free to reach out with any questions after this uh, call is over so that you know, I can answer those one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I'm more than happy to do that. All right, I think that's it. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much for, for attending. As Josh mentioned, we'll get this, uh, the record of this conversation out. We'll get a deck out to you as well. Um, really appreciate you guys' time. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. All the best until then, stay safe.